Hi. And thanks very much to the organizers for getting us going today. So as some of my students in the audience may know, I keep a print in my office here of a painting from Sweden, where many of my family members come from, uh, of the Brenvindraken, Brenvin being the uh, literal translation burnt wine, or the early Swedish term for distilled liquor, sort of the precursor to absolute vodka. Uh, at one end of this dragon, its multiple heads feed on grain and fire and water. At the other head, end, another head spits out a river of alcohol. And at the mouth of that river is a party of dancers. But of course, at the end, those who have not bailed out are uh, delivered to the poorhouse, the prison, and the morgue. I keep this painting around to remind me of a couple of things. On the one hand, my Swedish roots, including the strong herbal spirits, I think are particularly characteristic of that region. And also my own immigrant ancestors, who by many accounts uh, struggled with alcoholism. So when I was a college chemistry student, uh, I found myself wondering more and more about how we got to this complicated place in our relationship with alcohol and what we could do about it. And as I've continued on this path professionally, I think it's become kind of a lens for me to understand my own family history, and I hope to give us some ideas uh, for the future. So, of course, in terms of the past, it turns out that ethyl alcohol, which is the same molecule in alcoholic beverages from beer up to vodka, uh, is, has been with us for a very long time. It's one of the simplest possible organic molecules. This is your chemistry part for the day. Um, a couple of carbon atoms with a few hydrogens attached to them, just like you'd see in hydrocarbon fuels or oils. And at the other end, a hydroxyl group, an oxygen with another hydrogen, just like we would see in water. So alcohol, then, is part oil and part water, two substances that don't normally mix. And by inhabiting both of these chemical worlds, alcohol ends up with some very special properties that have had an enormous impact on our ancestors. And three of the, there's three that I want to focus on today, the first of which, and possibly the most important from an evolutionary standpoint, may be that it's a volatile molecule. So it turns out the, the oily parts, which are here shown in black, of alcohol molecules have very weak interactions with one another, weak attractive forces. And it takes only a little bit of extra heat energy to cause liquid alcohol molecules to fly apart into the gas phase. This is, of course, why most hydrocarbon fuels are pretty volatile themselves. And this would have meant that single-celled yeast organisms, before the Cretaceous period, living in trees or fruit, when they developed a mechanism to metabolize sugars, harness their metabolic energy by breaking them down into alcohol, that alcohol waste would have just evaporated away, removing the need for a circulatory system or other waste disposal process. So this would have been hugely advantageous to yeast. And it would have been pretty handy for our animal ancestors as well. So it would have been a recognizable source of protein-rich yeast and broken down sugars. And we know, for example, that fruit flies have a really specialized olfactory system to detect alcohol in their environment as an uh, indicator of rich nutrient sources to lay their eggs in. And uh, there's, of course, stories of animals from birds to elephants becoming drunk in the wild. Some primates, our closer ancestors, seem to uh, identify fresh fruit in the wild, at least in part by sniffing for ethanol fumes. It turns out that al alcohol activates sweetness receptors in our mouths, indicating at a physiological level the potential for rich nutrients in this, um, in this substance. So our taste for alcohol may have a truly evolutionary origin, and it turns out it has a great side benefit, that it kills a lot of microbes. So as illustrated in great technical detail by the terrific artist Becky Gabriel, uh, alcohol is, uh, is reasonably well tolerated by eukaryotes like yeast and ourselves. 
Uh, but simple bacterial cells are very sensitive, again, to disruptions in that oil-water interface that separates their, um, their cells from the rest of the environment. Um, this is, of course, the reason why alcohol is still the active ingredient in most hand sanitizers that we use today. Now, in contrast to the volatile and antimicrobial properties of alcohol, it's been a bit more controversial to work out the evolutionary origin, if any, of its intoxicating properties. The third major property um, that probably made it influential on our ancestors. It's certainly clear that alcohol in reasonable in doses has uh, in, uh, decreases anxiety and behavioral inhibition in animals as well as in people, and this could have had uh, some positive effects on social interaction. Um, but of course, at higher doses, it might also have been almost a defense mechanism uh, of yeast against being consumed. And so it's been a bit unclear exactly how beneficial alcohol intoxication actually would have been um, for any of our ancestors. Um, and in fact, when I began studying this subject as a chemist, I was taught that the neurological effects of alcohol were more or less an accident of its oily, watery properties. That alcohol had non-specific effects on the cell membrane, the oily membrane around brain cells, kind of similar to how it did on bacteria. Um, and this, of course, uh, seemed reasonable, um, but I would say really within the last couple of decades, we're learning that there are specific brain proteins, particularly receptor proteins in the brain, that are particularly sensitive to alcohol. I think many of us are familiar with the idea that a drug like heroin mimics the binding of natural endorphins to the brain's opiate receptors, simulating pleasurable responses. But finding a similar receptor response with alcohol was a little bit more challenging, again, because it's such a small and nondescript molecule. It was really only within the past five years that we've been able to determine protein structures to high enough resolution, of relevant molecules at least, to see alcohol binding to them. But it does seem to turn out, I think it's becoming increasingly clear, that alcohol may in fact mimic the binding of oily molecules, naturally produced, to proteins like well, the GABA receptor, shown here, which is involved in processes like anxiety and consciousness. And in fact, GABA receptor stimulation by molecules like alcohol also increases release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is, of course, involved in reward and potentially leads to addiction. So, there we go. But it, so, oh, yes, all right. Nope, that's backwards. Okay, so alcohol would have, indeed, provided a special combination of life-preserving and consciousness-changing effects to our ancestors. And indeed, that's what we see in the archaeological record, is that beer and mead and wine were critical, clean sources of nutrition for humans as early as 10,000 BCE. It's probably not surprising that alcohol took on enormous cultural significance in terms of symbols relating to religious practices in a variety of disciplines. In Europe, it gained the name aqua vitae, or water of life. In Sweden, the uh, god Odin survived on mead alone. And presumably my Swedish ancestors might not have been uh, too surprised when they transitioned to Christianity at symbolism of things like transubstantiation of, of blood into wine. Yes. And yet its practical role in our lives, that of alcohol, I posit has changed to an almost unrecognizable degree. Because of course, we don't, most of us in this room at least, rely heavily on alcohol for nutrition or clean water anymore. In fact, the nutritional value of alcohol at, uh, as it's normally consumed these days is almost negligible because we filter or distill out most of the yeast and other nutrients from it. So we don't get away with that one. So why in most communities are we using alcohol to a higher degree than ever before? So for one thing, of course, cultural traditions can persist even when their original inspiration has long passed. I think another thing is that with the development of distillation and distribution technologies, 
we're using alcohol in a range of ways that our ancestors probably would never have imagined. So in the, its early days, drinkers of concentrated alcohol like whiskey or gin would have had to contend uh, with some very aversive bitterness and burning sensations and other congeners that would have overwhelmed the natural sweetness of low-dose alcohol. And perhaps because of this, of course, now we see a growing catalog of specialty spirits and cocktail mixers and uh, various ways to create a tailored range of taste sensations. Um, and of course, far from uh, slowing down, it seems like every year we see new uses or new flavors or new physical forms. If uh, you uh, haven't seen the FDA-approved substance powdered alcohol on the shelves yet, it's, uh, it's coming soon. Um, and even beyond the realm of beverages, of course, we discovered that concentrated alcohol can have a wide range of other uses. So it can be used as an industrial or a medical solvent. I use it in my lab every day in the chemistry department. We even figured out that it worked as a reasonably good general anesthetic. We have better ways of doing that now. And uh, it turned out that its nutritional properties work not only for our own bodies, but also for our cars. Alcohol is up to 10% of the gasoline in most vehicles in the United States today. So, even as our evolutionary basis for using alcohol has faded, we are using it and we have access to it and it's culturally integrated in our lives, um, certainly to a persistent and maybe even increasing degree. And I posit that this is a problem for our future because of course, like so many things that are harmless or even helpful in small doses, Large quantities of alcohol are very harmful to our brains and our bodies. Drinking compromises our motor coordination, making modern tasks like driving particularly dangerous. Drinking uh, in some individuals increases violent behavior, potentially leading to harm to drinkers and to others. And note that the doses we're talking about here, uh, commonly discussed as binge drinking, are common, four to five drinks in a sitting. And higher doses of alcohol over short periods of time can lead to loss of consciousness, um, unconscious vomiting, other life-threatening conditions. And of course, some individuals become addicted to alcohol. A state associated with chronic biochemical and physical changes in the brain. Again, this is seen in animals as well as in people. And we don't yet know all of the factors involved yet, but it's clear that some individuals are at a higher familial or environmental risk for developing alcoholism. And even if people are not addicted, heavy drinking over even moderate periods of time can cause damage to the liver, to the cardiovascular system, to the gastrointestinal tract, and brain damage. So, Alcohol today is associated with one in 10 deaths among working age adults in the US. It's clear that the brand in Drachen is not done with us yet. Now, obviously, as a chemist, going back to that story, I do what I do because I believe that chemistry can be part of the solution to more underlying inequities. So, I guess my hope is that by understanding some of the biochemistry, behind both the beneficial and harmful effects of alcohol in our lives, we can maybe create a new relationship with it, better suited to our social and technological future. Alcohol has properties of both oil and water, both a liquid and a gas, both a food and a poison. It stimulates our sense of nutrition and reward, and it brings us together in ways that not a lot of things seem to these days. But like so many things, like fuel, like food, maybe like information, too much of it is terrible for us. And I think this, that what this suggests for our future is that, it, uh, th that we're not going to do away with alcohol necessarily as a society. But I think it may mean embracing a wider range of social habits with and without alcohol. And it certainly must mean empowering our loved ones and ourselves 
to seek appropriate support, whether it's medical or social, maybe pharmaceutical, certainly psychological, when alcohol use becomes harmful. So Brian Vins Drakken brought community and corruption to my ancestors. I hope that in the future we can find better ways to understand and to moderate its impact this, of this very special molecule in all of our lives. So, thanks. <laughs>